Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to the first of the lectures for the academic year of 2013-2014. And it's great to see a lot of friends and students from our program on pain research, education, and policy here. And thanks to the wonders of modern technology, we will be recording Dr. Schmidt's talk and posting it on our website so it'll be immortalized and memorialized alongside talks by other leaders internationally, such as Henrik Kellett, uh, Mac Gallagher, uh, literary people like Judy Foreman and Melanie Thernstrom. And this will be available widely for people to uh, benefit from. We're, this is the Sackler Lecture. Uh, we have an annual Sackler Lecture each year. Actually, it's taking place in the Sackler Building, but the Sackler family was very generous in the startup of this program about a dozen years ago. So we memorialize that by bringing in world-class people, and we have had really world leaders. And I would submit to you that Bill Schmidt is a world leader in the development of novel analgesics. Bill Schmidt is someone that anyone in the pain space knows, and he's been uh, operating at a very high and prominent level for several decades. Uh, I personally got to know Bill because for many years he would publish a score sheet, an annotated tally of where all kinds of different drugs were in the developmental pipeline. And Bill is still very much doing that, but he's done so much more. He's the editor of a monograph on pain. And in addition to serving in professional societies, he's, for example, he's the past president of the Eastern Pain Association, which is the oldest pain association in the US historically predates the American Pain Society, but it's still the largest regional affiliate of the American Pain Society. In addition to doing that type of thing, Bill is exceptionally in demand as a go-to person for the development of novel therapies. He has an unparalleled grasp of what it takes to go from the test tube or the bench or the animal study to an approved and marketed drug, and actually he succeeded in bringing several compounds through that pathway, the most recent one being a peripheral mu opioid blocker, uh, which is designed to reduce opioid-induced constipation. Uh, Bill is a graduate in pharmacology from the University of California, San Francisco, did a postdoc uh, fellowship at Boston University, which was very prominent in postdoc studies of opioids at the time, and then joined DuPont where he was involved in the development and approval of naltrexone, uh, several combination products, and uh, also um, other related opioids. Bill has, at present, a number of companies that are actively uh, seeking his advice. Some of these are virtual companies. As the president of North Star Consulting, he right now uh, is involved in advising companies in North America, Europe, Asia, Latin America, and Australia. And right now, he's on the scientific or medical boards of an academic laboratory, four biotech companies, and an internet medical publishing company. So you can see this is a pretty substantial person from whom we can all learn a lot. So I'm going to ask you to join me in welcoming uh, Bill Schmidt and uh, look forward to his lecture. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Well, it's really a pleasure to have a chance to be here at Tufts University School of Medicine. I, I view Boston as being one of the meccas of medicine in the United States. And to be able to come back to Boston and talk to your group, particularly at Dan Carr's invitation, is, a, is really a great pleasure and honor for me. And what I want to do is just take you on a quick tour of some of the things that I have been thinking about over the last few years in terms of creating new ways to treat pain medicine that are fundamentally different than what we've done in the past. I wanted to go into pain medicine since the time that I was six years old because I had an accident. I fell off of a climbing platform in my kindergarten. I broke both the bones in my arm. And I still remember to this day being in the emergency room with the surgeons injecting lidocaine all around my supposed broken bone, expecting the lidocaine to work, and it didn't. And then I remember the ether mask coming in and finally waking up and having my arm in a cast. And, and I realized A, there are a lot of physicians who don't receive adequate training in pain medicine, and B, they don't have the right tools in many cases to do what they really need to do. 
And I decided at that point I wanted to do something different in my own career to make that possible. And I've had the good fortune to be able to stay in pain medicine all of my life. Uh, from the time that I completed my postdoc, I was at DuPont Pharmaceuticals, which then became part of DuPont Merck. I headed the preclinical discovery effort for them for 17 years. And then the interesting thing that happened was that as companies grow, they look at their portfolio, they decide where they want to make investments, they bring in outside consultants from McKinsey and other places, and the results that came back was literally they said there's no future in pain medicine because it's completely subserved by cheap generic aspirin and morphine. So where are you going to go to find new products? Well, within two years after they said that, COX-2 compounds came on the market and they became billion dollar products within the first year that they were being sold. It told me, A, that there was a tremendous unserved medical need here and that people would march very quickly with their feet and with their pocketbooks to invest in areas that would be new in the area of pain medicine. Even as we think about it now, the COX-2 inhibitors were not that new. But it said to me also, I was going to change what I was doing. And I literally walked into the executive vice president's office the next day. And I said, David, every company needs to make decisions on what they do when they grow up. I want to stay in pain medicine. Thank you. I'd like to buy the products that are in my lab, start my own company, and become an entrepreneur. And I've been on that path ever since. And I've now had the chance to work for several small companies as well as bigger companies as a consultant, and as Dan said, in the United States and elsewhere. So I have a chance to take a look at a lot of innovations in pain medicine. And what I want to do is just feature for you some of the ways that we've gone beyond aspirin, beyond morphine, in creating better therapeutic compounds. And now how do I change the slides? Do I, do I ask you to change the slide, or do I have a... Okay, tell you what, I'll just come back here periodically and hit this, this button. So pain is a huge market. Uh, this is from one of the companies that I've been working with. Pain is a $38 billion a year market. It's the number one reason why people visit their doctors. It's dominated by aspirin and other NSAIDs, by opioids, and by, more recently, some reuptake inhibitors, compounds that work centrally that uh, tend to work through either norepinephrine or serotonin, which are transmitters in the brain, to, uh, to decrease the way that people respond to pain. But what's happened is that very few really new drugs have gotten in the market over the last few years. The vast majority are reformulations of older drugs in ways that certainly contribute something to pain medicine, but they are not new drugs. Uh, drugs with known mechanisms or combinations, some of which I've helped to contribute to the marketplace, are also there. And in the green slice is the ones with the really new mechanism action that would be new to the, to the practice of pain medicine. We know, going way back, that opioids have been used since the dawn of time. The Ebers papyrus was discovered in a tomb of uh, a pharaoh uh, it comes from roughly uh, 1550 BC. It described the use of opioid compounds in combination with other drugs that were used not necessarily to treat pain, but to use to treat dysentery. Uh, Sydenham in 1680 wrote that among the remedies which it has pleased Almighty God to give to man to relieve his sufferings, none is so universal and so efficacious as opium. So for a very long period of time, we had drugs that were dominated by opium and by aspirin or willow bark and, and related anti-inflammatories. Think about what if you were an early explorer coming to, well, we didn't know it as the United States, but going across an ocean looking for India, not knowing what you're going to bump into, you've got to put on your ship everything that you can need to sustain your sailors for months or maybe years at a time. So here's Christopher Columbus 500 years ago. He doesn't really know where he's going. What does he put on his ship? We don't know specifically for Christopher Columbus, but looking back at some of the texts from the 15th to 17th centuries, what we see are a lot of opioid compounds and opium itself, uh, and then a lot of things that are, are, well, not recognized as being therapeutic per se, in terms of today's practice of medicine. So the primary compounds that he used, not unexpectedly, were opium and related compounds. Let's jump forward a little bit to the Revolutionary War. What were they using to treat pain then? 
And we know from actual uh, formularies that they had anodynes. What does that mean? It means relief of pain. They had antiarthritics. They had antidysentery. Well, all of those involve opium and related compounds. Antipyretics. Well, that's what aspirin or willowbark does. Emetics and, and, and other things. So even in those days, we had aspirin and, or aspirin-like compounds. We didn't have aspirin quite yet. Uh, and, and we had opium-related compounds. So let's go beyond the opium and the aspirin-like compounds to where we are in today's explore, exploration of the world or even beyond the world to the moon. What are you going to take with you if you're going to send somebody away and you have unknown medical problems that may occur? Well, I sent a letter to NASA a few years ago, and I said, what do you carry on the space shuttle? So they sent me a list of 80 different drugs that are used on the space shuttle. And here we have acetaminophen or Tylenol. They had acetaminophen with codeine, Tylenol number three. They had aspirin, bupivacaine, a local anesthetic. They had our typical NSAID aspirin-like drugs. Uh, here's lidocaine as well. And opioids, meperidine, Demerol, and morphine sulfate. Fundamentally, not a whole lot different than what Christopher Columbus had or even what they had back in the days of the ancient pharaohs. So where do we go from there? Well, let's take a look at what's happened over the last 125 years in the area of anti-inflammatory and antipyretic analgesic compounds. It's been just 125 years since acetanilid was the first antipyretic compound that was approved, uh, initially in France in 1886. This was followed by phenacetin. Those of you who were around in the 1950s remember phenacetin as one of those APC, aspirin, phenacetin, caffeine products, and aspirin itself from 1899. And then it took a few more years to get the majority of the NSAIDs on the market, going all the way up through a flurry of activity in the 1980s, 1990s, and then the COX-2 compounds coming in in the late 1990s and finally in the early 2000s. But it seems that almost as soon as we had these new compounds come on the market, we found that they were associated with various types of toxicities that hadn't been known before they were introduced. So within a year of the time that acetanilid was on the market, it was recognized that some of the patients began turning blue from methemoglobinemia. Not a good thing because it tends to kill patients. It was taken off the market very rapidly, but it was replaced by phenacetin. It took another 50 years to take phenacetin off the market because of hepatotoxicity. So I have here the reasons that withdrawals have occurred. 30 drugs have entered the market in the United States. 10 have been withdrawn due to methemoglobinemia, renal toxicity, blood dyscrasias, anaphylaxis, hepatotoxicity, or cardiovascular events such as hypertension or thrombosis. So where do we go in terms of developing new compounds? We know that just in our own very recent memory, rofecoxib or Vioxx was taken off the market. Bextra, valdecoxib was taken off the market because of cardiovascular, because patients were having increase in strokes and increases in heart attacks. What I maintain is that each time there's been one of these failures, as tragic as it is, it's given us the opportunity to learn from that and develop better testing techniques to learn early on whether these are going to be risk factors for newer compounds coming along. There are a number of products that were never approved in the United States that are leading uh, NSAIDs or COX-2 inhibitors worldwide, so the FDA has, in fact, given us some protection against that, and they've raised the bar. What has happened, unfortunately, is there have been almost no new NSAIDs now for over 10 years, except there's one that I've been working on for a Korean company for the last six years called CG100649. Let me tell you a little bit about this compound because my involvement with this compound actually started here in Boston seven years ago when a consulting company locally asked me and asked a former FDA division director to comment on the profile of a new drug that a Korean company had discovered and they were interested in taking a look at. And the first thing that I saw was COX-2. So I began to think, what have we learned from the past? Where are we going to take this? We know that hypertension has been a significant problem, not only with rofecoxib, but also with all NSAIDs, even naproxen will increase blood pressure uh, in a variety of patients. These peaks here, you may not be able to see them very easily, are peaks showing that you may have 10 to 20 degrees increase in blood pressure or uh, even as much as 20 millimeters increase in blood pressure. Here for naproxen, it's low. For rofecoxib, it's higher. For celecoxib, it's relatively low. If you look at 
the percentage of baseline normotensive patients, meaning normal blood pressure patients who become hypertensive, it was disproportionately high for rofecoxib Vioxx, which is one of the reasons why it was taken off the market, because that did lend to fatalities. The FDA now has black box warnings on all NSAID drugs. You buy it over the counter in your local uh, convenience store or, or grocery store, you will find a black box warning that you should take this product at the lowest possible effective doses for the shortest period of time because of potential toxicity. So why was I interested in this other new compound? Well, I had to look at the fact that all of the NSAIDs also cause significant um, GI adverse effects uh, caused uh, by bleeding in the GI tract. And that changed when Vioxx and Celebrex, uh, Celecoxib, became on the market in 1998. That actually decreased. But then in 2004, when they were taken off the market, the so-called gastroprotective gap began to change. Uh, same year that Vioxx and Bextra were withdrawn from the market. It told me there's still a very important need for developing NSAID-related compounds that have safety for not only the cardiovascular system, but also for the GI system. So if we go from the past, from Christopher Columbus and the other early explorers, and the past of opium-related compounds and the early NSAID compounds to where we are today, we have to recognize that the FDA plays an important role in what we are doing and how we are doing it. For the NSAIDs, most companies walked away 10 years ago because the FDA began to say that they would require, before approving a drug, cardiovascular outcome studies or GI outcome studies to show that your new product is no worse than existing products that are on the market. Good regulatory policy, good medical policy, but these studies require 20,000 to 30,000 patients, and even Merck and Pfizer can't afford to invest in studies like that. So for most companies worldwide, it ended the NSAID era that began 125 years ago. But as I said, there was a Korean company that was interested in a new approach. The FDA has issued guidance. They tell us how to do things better than, they, than we have done before. They've issued a safe use initiative, even with drugs like acetaminophen. We think about acetaminophen, which Tylenol, we use it for treating fever and pain in children. But we don't recognize that there is enough Tylenol in one bottle of 30 tablets that you buy in your grocery store that if you consumed it all at once, that it can kill you. So for every drug that we have, you have to look at a balance between potential toxicity and balance between safety. And if it's your role as it is for me in developing new drugs, we have to build safety in right from the beginning. If we look at the NSAID drugs that have been approved in the last, uh, say, three years, They've all been combinations or reformulations of older products. None of them have been new chemical entity compounds. Why? Because the FDA doesn't have the threshold of requiring huge cardiovascular or GI outcome studies if you are working with older existing compounds. So there are some advances. Uh, as an example, Horizon Pharmaceutical put in an H2 uh, receptor blocker that's a, a, a compound that prevents uh, acid reflux, combine that with ibuprofen, and it causes less gastric irritation than you would have using ibuprofen alone. Um, an IV formulation of acetaminophen became available in the United States. It's been available in France for more than 20 years prior to that. A nasal spray of uh, another product that's been used primarily as an intravenous uh, anti-inflammatory compound, Cuterolac, became available uh, for treating short-term types of pain. And here's another compound that's a combination of naproxen and a uh, compound that is GI protective that may be useful, particularly for patients who need to take these drugs for longer periods of time. So this is kind of, for at least two of these compounds, a Band-Aid approach to making these products better than what they are. That's not where I'm interested in going. I'll give you a few more examples. Here is a topical NSAID, the first one that was approved by the FDA. For many years, the FDA said, we don't believe in topically applied NSAID drugs. Rheumatologists, so, had formulations made in their local pharmacies because they knew if you apply it to the knee, it has higher concentrations in the knee than it's going to have elsewhere in the body. Patients get better. 
Well, finally, somebody did the appropriate studies and got a drug approved that had that particular profile. So here, we'll go back to the story from Korea, from seven years ago here in Boston. And Crystal Genomics, the name of the company, was a company that was founded based upon advanced x-ray crystallography. They had a bigger magnet than anybody else in the world. And they could do more precise x-ray crystallography studies, not necessarily using magnets, but using other advanced equipment, uh, than anybody else could. So companies like AstraZeneca, Pfizer, GSK would come to them to help them solve enzyme structures so they could develop new compounds. And finally, after 10 years, they said, we'd like to develop our own compound. And they had one with a, a profile that I consider to be absolutely fascinating. I'll tell you why. Well, for one, they had the crystal structure. They knew exactly how this test compound, CG10649, bound to the COX-2 enzyme, the COX-1 enzyme. We knew that it was a super potent compound. It was, in fact, more potent than any other NSAID that I'd ever seen before. But potency, or the number of milligrams that's required to inhibit an enzyme, to me, is not really very important. For the people who have to build factories to make this stuff, it's important. For me, I don't care whether it's useful at a dose of one milligram or 1,000 milligrams. And by the way, 1,000 milligrams is the dose of, of Tylenol that you tend to use. Uh, what means to me is how efficacious is the product? How effective is it in relieving pain? Well, one of the things that I also saw with this compound was that it inhibited another enzyme that I hadn't seen associated with this class of compounds before, before called carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are on the market. The prototypic compound is called acetazolamide. What's it used to treat? Hypertension. And I thought, well, that's a really clever idea. In one molecule, some brilliant chemist in Asia has put together a compound that inhibits COX-1 and COX-2, but it also binds to an enzyme that may help to mitigate against the hypertension that is known to occur with all classes of NSAID drugs. And I also knew from some friends of mine who are mountain climbers that acetazolamide is one of those drugs that you use to treat mountain sickness. So I thought, wow, this is really kind of clever. And I told the company, I think you've got a great profile, but in today's post-Vioxx climate, you need to pay very close attention to cardiovascular safety. So you need to do this and this and this up front in the way you design your clinical trials. And I was about ready to walk away, and they said, Dr. Schmidt, we liked what you said. Now, would you design those clinical trials for us? So over a period of six years, I designed six clinical trials that we did in the United States, in Europe, and in Asia, and developed a profile that was really quite promising. One of the things we found, surprisingly, was that in tissues where there was a lot of carbonic anhydrase present, which I will show here as CA with the green symbols, the product bound to carbonic anhydrase. In tissues where there wasn't any carbonic anhydrase, then it bound selectively to COX-1 or COX-2 enzymes and produced its therapeutic effect. So what this said to me was, this has stealth technology. It is latching on to enzymes that are acting as active carriers that then release it to where it needs to be. Why? Because this is where your red blood cell is. It's the highest reservoir of carbonic anhydrase in the entire body. So the red blood cell becomes a reservoir for the compound, carrying it in an inactive form to every tissue in the body and delivering it to inflamed joints where there's no carbonic anhydrase. Wow, that's really a clever idea. So does it really work? Well, here, other tissues that have high concentrations of carbonic anhydrase happen also to be the GI epithelium. And so in those tissues, it will bind selectively to the, GI, to the carbonic anhydrase, and potentially you'll not have GI erosions or other bleeding episodes in the GI tract that create the gastrointestinal toxicity associated with all of the NSAID drugs. So as I had said, right from the beginning, and my advice to this company is, let's take a look at cardiovascular safety from the very first trial that we did. And so we did. We looked certainly at uh, systolic blood pressure and at uh, diastolic blood pressure. But we also measured, as you do typically in a phase one clinical trial, the concentration of the drug in plasma. But because I saw that carbonic anhydrase relationship, I said, let's also measure how much there is in whole blood 
and compare that to how much there is in plasma. And we found, very surprisingly, there was 100 times more drug in whole blood, shown here in blue, than there was in plasma. The plasma concentrations were remarkably low. But it's, the plasma concentration was high enough, based upon our target therapeutic level of 50 nanograms per ml, to inhibit the COX-1 and COX-2 as it got into the joints. And so I knew that we would get a good therapeutic response, but the vast majority of the drug would be locked away in the red blood cells. The only other class of drugs that has any differential between whole blood and plasma levels are, in fact, the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, like acetazolamide or its cousin here, methazolamide, where it has a 15 or 12, 12 and a half to 15 fold ratio between the plasma and blood levels. So it too is riding along by binding to carbonic anhydrase in blood, and it has very low plasma levels. We found in doing the remaining six clinical trials that I was involved with that we were able to reproduce this 80 to 100 fold ratio in every patient that we had. Young patients, older patients, men, women, normal healthy volunteers, patients with osteoarthritis. It was a very solid finding. And the drug was very effective in terms of treating pain and other symptoms associated with osteoarthritis. In the field of pain medicine, we oftentimes use various scales that are FDA approved. This particular one is one that came originally from Australia called the WOMAC scale. Uh, the Wisconsin, uh, no, it's not Wisconsin, that's here in the United States. So the Western Ontario, thank you, uh, something or other uh, scale which is used. And it has several different questions that patients fill out. Uh, the vast majority of the questions are for pain. And so if we look at, well, the, in fact, this is the, the whole suite of questions. We had a remarkably uh, striking 35% decrease in the Womax score uh, within 21 days of the time that we initiated therapy. And we saw that even in the washout period that it maintained a strong analgesic effect in these patients because with it binding to carbonic anhydrase and acting as a reservoir, it also gave it a long half-life. Take it once a day, it's going to be effective still at almost the same blood levels 24 hours later. So we found in strategy, we could give a loading dose and then very small maintenance doses of about one milligram a day. And even a week after the patient took the last dose, they had a therapeutic level in their blood. So we saw that here in the Womax scores. Uh, if we looked at physical function, if we looked at pain as a, as a subscale of the entire WOMAC, if we looked at stiffness, we had statistical significance, high levels of statistical significance on every one of those. And based upon the level of activity that we had, we could say that CG10649 at a dose of about 1.2 milligrams a day is comparable to Vioxx at a dose that is 20 times higher or Celebrex at a dose that is Two, uh, two orders of magnitude higher. Um, well, as I said, I don't really care how many milligrams it causes, uh, is, is it required to produce the effect. I just care about what the therapeutic response is. And I saw a therapeutic response here without hypertension, without GI erosions, without bleeding, that was comparable to the best of the best of the drugs in this class. Patients liked it. When we asked them, how do they rate this drug compared to what their previous condition was, at the therapeutically effective dose where we gave eight milligrams for their very first dose to load up their blood, and then 1.2 milligrams per day, we had statistical significance with more than half of the patients saying that their symptoms were very much improved to much improved, and the remaining all said that they had some improvement, but not necessarily optimal. What I did beyond this was I ran up to, in additional efficacy studies to doses as high as eight milligrams a day, a supra-therapeutic dose, to not only see whether we could get greater efficacy, but also whether there'd be safety signals that would come in. Remember that I told you that if you take an entire bottle of Tylenol off the supermarket shelf, it's enough to kill you. If you were to take eight times the dose of an NSAID like ibuprofen or naproxen, I can guarantee you that within two weeks, you're going to have a GI bleed. So I challenged this compound and I gave it at a dose that was about six and a half to seven times higher than the therapeutic dose. And also we were able to get through that with no hypertension and with no GI bleeds. Here was the story for hypertension at the beginning. Uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressure were just rock solid throughout this period, not only the active treatment period, but also in the washout period. So I was certainly very much encouraged. 
First compound of its class that inhibits two enzymes, the COX-related enzymes and the carbonic anhydrase enzymes. It uses the carbonic anhydrase enzymes in a very unique way, potentially to create a better, safer aspirin-like drug. And it had a very high efficacy profile compared to existing NSAIDs, but full stop. Why? We get back to what the FDA would require to put a drug in this class on the market. And with the FDA saying publicly that they would require large GI outcome studies to approve any new NSAID in today's era, meaning 20,000, 30,000 patients, meaning clinical trials that would cost 100 to $200 million to conduct with no guarantee that the FDA would even approve the drug afterwards. And that's happened twice, where companies have done large cardiovascular outcome studies and their drugs were not approved. Nobody wants to invest in it. So the Korean company, a very small company, was unable to find any partners in the United States or in Europe. They all said they loved the profile, they loved the science and the technology behind it, but from a regulatory viewpoint, they were unprepared to proceed until either the FDA said, we will approve this and allow you to do post-approval outcome studies. In other words, after the drug's approved, you can collect all of this additional data, or they weren't willing to touch it at all. And so the company said, for our phase three clinical trials, we're going to just close shop and develop it only for the Korean market. That's a loss potentially of a very important new compound that has safety factors that are hardwired into it that could have been of some benefit here in the United States. Now it may come back here eventually because the strategy is get it approved in Korea, register every one of the patients in the first two years who receives the drug, collect the cardiovascular safety, collect the GI safety data, and then use that to submit along with a new drug application in the United States or in Europe. So I can't disagree with what their strategy is, but in February when they came to that decision, I said, you don't need me to help you with the Korean market, so you're on your own, and I ended my involvement with them. But that doesn't stop what I'm doing with other companies, because what's been great for me as an independent consultant is I've worked with several companies at the same time. In some cases, just being a member of a scientific or medical advisory board, but in other cases, actually taking on the conduct of the clinical trials, as I did here. I never worked with CG as an employee. I worked with them only as a consultant. So where do we go in terms of the future? We may be on the, ver the verge of several breakthroughs for non-opioid non-NSAID uh, analgesic products. Here's some of the other things that I've been doing in the last few years. We've begun to learn that capsaicin, the active ingredient in hot peppers, causes intense burning and stinging reactions. But through some work that was done originally at UC San Francisco by David Julius, who talked last week at the New York Academy of Sciences about his discovery of what's called the TRIP-V1 receptor, we now understand that Capsaicin binds to this receptor, and at low therapeutic concentrations, it's enough to give the spice to much of the food that we eat, where we put in chili peppers and other things. And for those of us who like Thai food or other really hot food, it's, again, the thing that puts the fire into the food. But we also have learned that capsaicin, if you apply it in other ways, can desensitize nociceptors or pain fibers that are involved in a variety of different types of pain. How does it do it? Well, it actually ablates or causes the end terminus of these pain fibers to disappear. If we take a piece of skin and stain it selectively for small nerve fibers, here's what we see. The green fibers are so-called C-fiber nociceptors that are coursing through the tissue. You also see blood and other stuff around there. And after treatment with two micrograms of capsaicin, the small unmyelinated fibers, the ones that don't have the myelin sheath around them, have disappeared. Uh, what that has done is it has relieved the dysfunctional nociceptors in those tissues. In this case, we were looking for patients who had C fibers that were firing in an aberrant fashion that were causing intense pain in patients. And we looked at ways to silence them. And by removing them, you haven't actually killed the cells themselves, but it's caused the, the terminals of those cells to die. And it takes then months for the axon to regrow and reinnervate those tissues. And during that period of time, the patients can be pain-free. So how do we apply that? Well, one of the other companies that I'm working with 
is looking at an orphan drug indication called Morton's neuroma. Morton's neuroma is an exceptionally painful uh, intertarsal uh, condition in the, in the foot generally, uh, particularly in women who wear high heels, where there is impingement of a couple of bones on a nerve fiber that causes inflammation and intense pain. The conventional way of treating that is to inject the neuroma with drugs that will cause some scarring, such as ethanol, high concentrations of ethyl alcohol, or to inject anti-inflammatory drugs like prednisone, or to go in surgically and to cut out that inflamed bit of tissue. If you go in surgically, you end up causing permanent numbness in the foot. If you inject prednisone or if you inject alcohol as a sclerosing agent, it's effective in less than half the patients, and patients come back and then they have to end up having surgery. Well, we had some prototypic studies with capsaicin injected directly into the uh, neuroma. Uh, in this case, it's, it's showing a freehand injection. What we're going to be doing in next stage studies is to use ultrasound to guide the needle so that we are absolutely certain of the placement of the needle in the neuroma itself. And this shows that after a single injection of capsaicin, which here is called VLN 4975, we are able to see within a week a substantial decrease in the amount of pain compared to placebo treatment. And that continues with even greater levels of pain relief out to four weeks. And we had some patients going out to eight weeks. Single injection, profound, prolonged, local pain relief without the drug going at sufficient concentrations to cause any damage in or adverse effects in any other organ in the body. That's remarkable. Here's actually one of the ultrasound uh, images to show exactly how we can inject. It's a dark spot right there, which is the inflamed nerve, the Morton's neuroma, and this is what happens afterwards. The inflammation is gone, and then there's relief of pain without causing desensitization of the foot. We also see the possibility of local injections of capsaicin in other tissues, such as in patients who have post-amputation pain problems, neuromas that are developing in the scarred joint uh, or the, 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 what's left of the joint uh, and that uh, rubs against their prosthesis. We see the possibility of injecting capsaicin into painful joints for patients who have osteoarthritis. And again, desensitizing those unmyelinated nerves without, by the way, causing a loss of sensation. It's not working like a local anesthetic. So you can still feel other types of pain in that joint. You can feel proprioception or your, your ability to actually understand where your foot is contacting the ground when you do this. And we have some pilot clinical data in osteoarthritis showing the potential effect. And I say potential effect because we have a lot of work to do before we finish this work for creating a injectable high-strength capsaicin product to desensitize nerve fibers. Another project that I've been involved, been involved in that was just been published a year ago uh, in the journal Pain was using topical clonidine, another FDA-approved product, in a completely new formulation, a topical product where it's applied locally to the feet of patients who have painful diabetic neuropathy. Well. This gets into an area called neuropathic pain. Uh, it's, it's one of those sexy words that big pharma companies like to talk about because that's been the area that they've been investing in. The sort of drugs that have been approved for treating neuropathic pain in the last 10, 15 years have been drugs like duloxetine or gabapentin or pregabalin that work centrally, that work on the brain to change the way that the brain processes the understanding of pain, but it doesn't arrest pain where it's actually being produced. Uh, and the problem is that those drugs tend to cause a lot of adverse effects on the central nervous system. As our country gets, let's say, larger in many respects, we have a greater incidence of diabetes. Patients who have diabetes long term tend to go on to having a painful diabetic neuropathy that's caused by nerve fibers initially in their feet both feet at the same time, it's called a bilateral distribution, that are just firing away as those nerves 
are beginning to actually die. And, and eventually, the nerves will die back and patients lose sensation in their feet. They may later on lose sensation in their hands. They may lose uh, some of the small fibers in their eye and they may become blind. So first off, avoid getting diabetes to begin with if you can. And then if you have diabetic neuropathy, try to find a way to treat it in a way that is going to be sparing of those nerves as best as you can. We conducted a study um, in uh, about 179 patients with painful diabetic neuropathy with our test topical clonidine product, knowing that clonidine would quiet those C-fiber nociceptors in the feet without causing them to die or do other things. If we look first off at what is the best evidence for the best drugs that are used to treat painful diabetic neuropathy, uh, here's a drug from Lilly called duloxetine or Lyrica that if you look at the difference between the placebo group and the active drug groups after 12 weeks of treatment, the best that you can see is that you get about a, a one, fold, uh, one, one, one um, unit additional change on a zero to 10 scale between those patients in the placebo group and in the treatment group. Now, how much change does that actually use? We tend to use a scale of zero to 10 for rating pain. That's pretty well known and established for probably everybody in this room because if you have any type of pain in the hospital or if you have arthritis or any other painful condition and you go to your physician, they are now mandated by law to ask you on a zero to 10 scale, how much pain do you have? And it's typical in patients with painful diabetic neuropathy that they will start out with a pain level of somewhere around six, which in this case, if we look at change from control, we'll say that that's the level of six. And so if we have a change of two, two and a half, maybe three maximum, at the best, we're relieving half of their pain. They still have some level of pain. But the maximum change between placebo and the active drug is a change of about one point. Keep that in mind. And, and, and I mean, it emphasizes another point, which is that patients, even in the placebo group, tend to say that their pain gets less. This is with not our drug. This is with a centrally acting drug that's affecting norepinephrine and serotonin in the brain. So our concept was treat the drug, treat, treat the product, treat the problem locally by applying a gel to the feet three times a day that contains uh, topical clonidine at a concentration that we know is enough to quiet down those nociceptors in the feet. We also knew there are very few approved, FDA approved medications, they all work centrally and they cause a lot of side effects and even then they're only partially effective. So here's our metered dose applicator. It provides a gel, just enough gel with one squeeze to treat one foot and then another foot. We had patients wear vinyl gloves on their hands so they were not being exposed to it except in the area where they really needed to use it. This is a safe medication to the extent that if you consume the entire contents of this bottle, you might become sedated but it's not gonna kill you. Clonidine has been around for a long time. Anesthesiologists use it frequently uh, as an adjunct in certain types of pain treatments, but it tends to decrease blood pressure. So it's not a widely used drug. You can't go and buy that at your pharmacy. You can't even buy it as a prescription product to use for most types of pain. You'd find it really in a hospital setting. Um, and this gives you a sense of we have some concept in terms of where it works, how it works at the receptor level. So our design was, and, and this was a study that we published in August a year ago, was a phase 2B study. It was in 179 patients with an adaptive design. We stopped it as soon as we saw that we had the potential to have statistical significance with the smallest number of patients who were treated. Uh, we had the patients apply either the topical clonidine or placebo three times a day for a total of 12 weeks. One of the things that we did to get us back to what I mentioned with capsaicin previously was we used a biomarker in the study and we used tissue histology to try to understand if we were actually going to be targeting the neurons that we wanted to quiet down and stop firing as fast as they were. Well, how did we do that? We knew from our work with capsaicin that it causes, if you apply it topically, a burning, stinging reaction wherever you put it. And you can buy over-the-counter capsaicin products um, in your local stores. 
It is uh, generally at a concentration of about 0.025%. The high potency uh, concentrations are about 0.75%. And they're used to treat osteoarthritis or other types of painful uh, conditions. And you apply it topically, usually three, four times a day. It causes burning stinging. It doesn't go away. That burning stinging is there for a period of time. Why is it causing burning and stinging? Because it's activating that V1 receptor that is on those small unmyelinated fibers. And we recognize that that would tell us whether those fibers were still active or not. I told you with painful diabetic neuropathy, as the, degree, as the disease progresses, those nerve fibers actually die. So what we decided for this particular trial was we're going to screen all of the patients for their ability to feel any sort of response at all to topically applied capsaicin before we randomize them into the clinical trial. It just gives us a sense, do they have functional nociceptors or not? And in half the patients, we also took punch biopsies, uh, meaning we took a small amount of tissue and then stained it for the presence of nerve fibers to see if that would tell us more information about who would ultimately respond to the drug or not. So let's take a look. What we found first off is that in the patients who had no ability to feel the capsaicin at all, we put it on, they couldn't feel anything. There was absolutely no separation between placebo and active for the 12 weeks of the trial. We did see that there was a placebo response. The placebo here is in red. And so those patients tended to show responses with about a one and a half to one change, maybe almost two change in their pain scores over a period of time, it tended to stabilize at about a, a one and a half point change. Um, and as I said, in the patients who could not feel the capsaicin, there was no difference between active and placebo. But in those patients who had any response at all, even the minimus, most minimal response, we saw a statistically significant decrease in favor of the capsaicin. And as we got to patients who had greater ability, in other words, the capsaicin response was enough that they said that there's at least mild pain. We saw a change here with a delta of 1.2. Well, that's a change that is at least as great, if not greater, than what I showed you with deloxetine. For a locally acting compound where 90% of the patients, we couldn't detect any compound at all in their blood. That's really a different way of looking at pain medicine and treating it locally. And here's patients who had a response of three or greater. The delta became 1.4. At that point, we, we ended up with not enough patients to go to any, any greater degree of separation than that in a small clinical trial. But it was absolutely remarkable that we went very quickly from no change. I didn't even put the no change on there. Very small change, greater change, maximum change, just by determining ahead of time, before they were even put into the trial, whether they could respond to capsaicin. Great biomarker that you could use to determine which patients are going to benefit from a pain medicine and which are not. So don't waste your time on it. So another product that I'm working on is designed as a gel to treat post neuralgia. Well, that's a big term. This is the sort of pain that occurs in older patients or in immunocompromised patients who have a reoccurrence of the chickenpox outbreak. Uh, well, it's not really as they are at older patients. They aren't getting chickenpox anymore. They're getting a condition called um, varicella zoster-induced uh, neuropathy, uh, or it's, it's called shingles is a lay term. A very intense burning sensation. It tends to be localized in one part of the body, oftentimes on the trunk, but it could be on the face. It could be behind the eyes. It could be virtually anywhere on the body. There's only one drug that's, I'm sorry, there are two drugs that are approved to treat uh, post-herpetic neuralgia, which is the post-pain um, syndrome that occurs after the healing of the shingles lesions. In mo most patients, there will be a period of about two weeks where you'll have this intense burning pain. You tend to have to stop wearing clothing or anything that will touch that skin because it will be exceptionally sensitive. Patients tend to use then opioids. They use cooling mechanisms. They use a variety of different types of drug to try to control the amount of pain. Uh, and in the vast majority of patients, after about two weeks to a month, 
the pain goes away. In some patients, after about two to three months, the pain may come back. That's called postherpetic neuralgia. It is used as one of the models that we have for treating a neuropathic pain syndrome, a pain syndrome where we can't actually see any direct pathology, but where there's some dysregulation of the nervous system that is causing severe pain. This is what the shingles looks like during an acute eruption. That then crusts over and the lesion goes away, but the pain can remain. That's the postherpetic neuralgia. What we want to do with our lidocaine gel is treat not only PHN, postherpetic neuralgia, but also treat this acute zoster outbreak where there's no approved drug um, and where patients suffer by having to use either steroids or opioids for a prolonged period of time. Here's some examples where it can affect the hands, the shoulders, the face, even behind the eyes. And if you map out, if you draw a line around the areas of skin where the patients have the most painful sensation, it tends to be somewhat irregular. The current, the current way to treat this is to use patches of lidocaine, 5% uh, lidocaine plaster, as they call it in Europe, or here a patch. Uh, it's called lidoderm. And in some patients, that produces some degree of pain relief, in part because of the lidocaine that's being released into the skin, and in part because you also have an occlusive covering. In other words, a patch that's covering the skin, and you're preventing then clothing or other things from contacting it. But it doesn't allow you to treat areas such as the forehead, where you have aesthetic problems, or the hands, or other areas that are irregular, that are not flat surfaces. So our concept is create a gel formulation that has the same blood concentrations of lidocaine as you have from the approved patch and see if that would be something that would be useful in treating acute zoster or postherpetic neuralgia. So we came up with a variety of formulations. We did a phase one study and our gel formulation in the optimal concentration causes a peak level of lidocaine in the blood at about 12 hours, and it lasts for as much as, well, there's still measurable quantities in the blood 48 hours later. But with that profile of peaking at 12 hours and then dropping to about half of that value, not even half that value within 24 hours, it says that a once a day application of this gel would potentially be a way that we could provide significant pain relief to these patients. Um, and by the way, that is double the level that you would get with lidoderm for the same period of time. So potentially we can get a greater amount of drug, a more effective level of drug into the blood. Uh, and it's still a very safe level. In terms of lidocaine in the blood, you'd have to go up to about, uh, about 100 times higher concentration of this to cause significant adverse effects. So I'm going to end this talk. I think we're getting toward 5 o'clock right now. And just say that these are some of the things that I've been working on, but there are other things I can't even really tell you about today. So how about thinking about another idea in pain medicine? There's a company that I've been advising for five years now. They're going to be presenting their first phase one data at the, uh, the, the anesthesia meeting in San Francisco next month. And it's a product that's given as a single dose, injected one time only, intrathecally, in other words, directly into the spinal cord, immediately prior to surgery, to reduce postoperative pain for days and to prevent the occurrence of chronic postoperative pain. It absolutely fascinated me to learn from Hendrik Kellett, who I know has talked here before, to learn several years ago that many patients after having operations still have pain three months later. We can certainly relate to that in patients who have amputation-induced pain. It's very common. Probably 70% of patients still have pain at, at three months afterwards, even years afterwards. Following mastectomy, 30 to 50% of women will still report pain three months later. Uh, following very common operations, such as a hernia, the incidence is very small, but because that's the most, one of the most frequent operations done in the United States and worldwide, the prevalence is huge. And the cost, think about it, the cost of having chronic pain that interferes with your quality of life, interferes with your ability to work, that occurs at that level is rather remarkable. So, one of the companies that I have been advising said, let's take a look at this in a fundamentally different way. Let's not create an analgesic per se. Let's create something that turns off the genes that are initiated the minute that a surgeon puts a scalpel on your skin. And that's what's in phase two clinical trials now. 
The phase one data will be uh, talked about at the uh, Anesthesia Society meeting next month. Phase two will be completed by the end of the year, and then we'll find out whether this entirely new approach is going to work. This is really the frontier of pain medicine. Another product, a topical product that's applied once daily for four days that may reduce osteoarthritis pain for weeks to months. And one more, an entirely new class of analgesic drugs that I've only known about for a short period of time, but somebody from the University of California called me in the spring this last year and said, are you Dr. Schmidt and do you know anything about pain medicine? And I said, yeah, where are you? And they said, well, we're just at the university. And I said, come on over to my office, let's talk. And I thought they were gonna tell me a story about something that came out of an academic lab that maybe they had a few mice, a few rats that had shown some degree of response, but they showed me something much bigger. They showed me activity against a very serious type of neuropathic and inflammatory pain in horses called laminitis. This is a horse that had been treated with all conventional therapies, including steroids and anti-inflammatory drugs, and was within half an hour of being euthanized humanely, because that's what happens in 70% of cases with horses that have laminitis. The horse is on its side because it has so much inflammation and pain from the condition in their foot that they can't stand. Horses that are on their side don't breathe properly, their gastrointestinal tract doesn't work prop properly, and they die spontaneously within a few days. So from the viewpoint of veterinary medicine, sometimes the best way to treat that is with a bullet to the head. What happened in this particular case was that the veterinarian knew one of the biochemists at the university who had been working on an entirely new class of pain medicine, called him up early in the morning, like 2 a.m. in the morning, and said, how much of your drug do you have available? He said, I'll come on over. They started an IV infusion, and within three hours, the horse was up on its feet. They gave the infusion for five days. They ran out of drug. They didn't know how much drug was necessarily going to be needed or for how long they needed to treat this horse. But hey, it's now been two years, and hula hala, this thoroughbred filly who was suffering from severe laminitis, the pain, and also morbid hypertension had complete resolution of symptoms after failing to respond to conventional therapy and is now being used to teach UC Davis students how to ride horses. That piqued my attention. <laughs> I said, tell me a little bit more about this new mechanism, this new drug, and how it works. Well, he told me you know, it's not only been used now in horses, but also in other companion animals. And I want to give that as a very important point. When we think about pain medicine, our focus has been for so much of our time on treating humans. But when we, we look at what's available to treat dogs and cats, there are far more limited options. NSAID drugs, aspirin and acetaminophen types of drugs, are far more toxic in dogs than they are in humans. So we tend not to use them at all. Opioid drugs cause in cats a condition called feline mania, where the cats literally are bouncing off the wall. It causes activation instead of sedation that it causes in humans and in dogs, and horses too. So you tend not to use very much opioid in horses, or if you do, you don't want to stand behind the horse because you're probably going to get kicked. And this drug, without causing any of those symptoms or side effects, restored a horse to normal function within three hours. This has now been replicated 10 times, no treatment failures. That, to me, gets exciting. That's why I get up every morning. And to end this talk, let me just say that we go back to Hippocrates from time in memoriam and say, divine is the work to subdue pain. Thank you very much. With this notion of interprofessional education in mind, it's important to emphasize that our scholarship fund for this program was named after a clinical pharmacologist who was the linchpin of studies in burned children at Shriners Burns Institute, Patricia Osgood. And we have benefited greatly by having pharmacists as faculty and students in our program consistently. So it's high time that we saw some of the remarkable things that could be brewing for the future in terms of pain relief from someone who is trained as a clinical pharmacologist and has really an incredible uh, window on the future. So if we have any questions, we have a few minutes. Uh, any questions for Dr. Schmidt? Sir. Sir.
So yeah, they're very, very good question. I'm glad you asked it because these have been around since time immemorial. Uh, the patents are use patents, as we call them, meaning method of use for the treatment of pain in a way that had not been anticipated previously. Uh, and that has been, in fact, the strength of the patent protection for the work with RCM Therapeutics that I've been doing. Uh, it's a curious thing. Uh, it's, use patents are exceptionally important. And if you look at the slide that I showed for all the approved uh, NSAID-related drugs in the last three years, those are all covered by use patents. They are combinations of older existing known drugs, but in ways that had not necessarily been anticipated or described in the literature previously. So that can provide some degree of protection. Um, the United States treats this a little bit differently than Europe. And I wish that there were, in fact, some, as I say, harmonization of the approaches in the United States and Europe. If you develop an entirely new drug in Europe, independently of patent life, it is a, if it's a drug that is a new chemical entity, you get a minimum 10 years of exclusivity. In the United States, you get three years. And if it's a combination of older drugs, you get three years of exclusivity. So we'll go three to five to 10. In three years, if you are combining older existing drugs, that may be enough to earn back your cost of development. If you have a use patent and can continue to protect it for longer than that, then that can be of some value. Um, think about how valuable that can be. Oxycontin is a combination well, it's a reformulation of oxycodone that's been around since the 1930s, but in an extended release formulation. And that's covered by formulation patents and use patents that have kept it proprietary to Purdue Pharma. So for them, that has allowed them to earn back their cost of development and finance this building and a whole lot of other important buildings around the world. Other questions? Yes. And Mr. Stark, we talk, so you may have addressed it. Um, do you foresee that in the next 10 years or so we'll see a significant reduction in the prescribing of opioids given the current political legal climate? And if so, do you think we'll just go back to under-treating pain again? Or do you think, what do you think will take place? I'm hoping that some of the reasons why I get up every morning will have a chance to replace and offer you additional opportunities for treating pain in the next 5 to 10 years. I see that we need to change our formulary. We are still too much dominated by the opioid class of drugs and the aspirin class of drugs. Opioid phobia is something that is among us right now. Uh, there has been over-prescribing. There has been a lot of abuse of opioids. The vast majority of the innovation in the opioid area have been developing so-called abuse-resistant opioid products, products that can't be abused by taking an oral tablet and crushing it and snorting it or injecting it, solubilizing and injecting it intravenously, that'll have some impact. But I think ultimately we have to find ways to replace those drugs or offer drugs that can be used in addition to opioids so we can cut the doses of opioids down substantially and replace it with other drugs that will be even more effective for treating patients. I think that's where we're going to see the change in the next five to 10 years. Thank you. A question on funding. You mentioned that uh, large pharma are avoiding uh, uh, developing new, a new pain medication. So I'm curious to ask, uh, generally speaking, who is, uh, which groups of uh, funders are funding these projects? Do yeah, you have a, a let, me, let me clarify that because that's a really, really important point. Pharma runs away whenever there's a problem. So they've run away from the COX-2 inhibitors or from NSAIDs in general. And they had, before that, they had run away from this area in the 1980s until the first COX-2 compound came on. And then suddenly everybody jumped in and you saw billions of dollars of profits being made. And then they hit a brick wall in 2004 when the first one was taken off the market and funding tended to dry out. But where pharma does invest is when you have compounds with new mechanisms of action. And sometimes they succeed and they become successful billion dollar products and sometimes they don't. Uh, the story I like to tell about this is something that was an also revolutionary until it hit a brick wall three years ago, which was an anti-NGF uh, antibody that was uh, originally forgotten by the people who developed it at Genentech in San Francisco, but the people who really believed in it spun off from Genentech, started their own company called Renat Neurosciences, they built up a tremendous amount of good preclinical evidence to show that their 
anti-NGF antibody had long-lasting pain relief in a variety of pain conditions. The thing that really excited me about that was that it could treat bone cancer pain in animals and arrest the erosion of the bone that tends to occur in bone cancer pain with a single injection of the NGF compound. Well, Big Pharma finally jumped in. Pfizer bought that company, Renat Neuroscience, for $500 million and started a very broad therapeutic program. They got to late phase two and early phase three clinical trials with tremendous results that were published in the most prestigious medical journals like the New England Journal of Medicine. But then they suddenly found that they had an unanticipated toxicity that was occurring more frequently in the active drug treatment group than in the placebo group. And that toxicity was before never seen, which was rapidly progressing osteoarthritis. And patients were having failures of joints in the body that were different necessarily than the joints that were being treated. So patients who had hip or knee pain were finding their shoulders were blowing out and they needed shoulder replacement. So the FDA put them all on clinical hold. Six major pharma companies were developing anti-NGF compounds. They all were put on clinical hold. There was an advisory committee meeting. The upshot was that the really dangerous condition occurred when patients were using NSAID drugs in addition to the anti-NGF. And if they weren't, if they were using the NGF antagonist only, uh, then uh, they tended not to have this rapidly progressing osteoarthritis. There's only one company that's been released from the clinical hold. I'm not aware that they've restarted their pain program right now. I think that that particular area is going to be subject to a lot of additional safety concerns and controls, not only now, but if and when the drugs are ever put on the market. So uh, I've heard more recently that Big Pharma is turning away from that, but they're waiting for that next big opportunity, another compound with a new mechanism of action that they see that could potentially replace the NSAIDs and the opioids that they have. Thank you. That's a really important distinction. Yes? So I have a question. You, met, you mentioned some stakeholders here in the industry, et cetera, but what about managed care organizations? Do you find you're, they're, they're taking a seat at the table earlier to learn about different analgesics? Or For the companies that I advise, they are, because I'm asking them to go out and ask those companies. Dan mentioned that one of the compounds that I helped to develop was a peripherally acting narcotic antagonist. That's designed to block opioid receptors in the GI tract without blocking receptors in the brain. It's on the market today. It has a restricted use for treating a condition called postoperative ileus. But we went to the payers. The company that I was working with at the time went to the payers early on, and they said, would you be willing to reimburse patients for this condition? How often do you have patients with opioid-induced constipation or patients with ileus or related symptoms? And the companies did their own independent evaluation. We had other companies that asked doctors whether they would prescribe it, and it came up with the highest level of prescriber interest and the highest level of uh, interest from managed care organizations that they had ever seen. We had an independent company run those surveys, IMS, and, and obviously we were very pleased with what we saw. You need to ask that question because I want to avoid, from the perspective of my diligence to companies, I want them not to have to invest tens to hundreds of millions of dollars on a program where they're not going to earn their money back at the other end. So they need to talk to the people who are going to be paying the bills. Yes? That's another really good question. Um, because what has happened is that the FDA has considered certain ways of measuring pain to be validated and other pain methods as being not validated. And they won't approve a drug unless you're using a validated measure. So that tends to focus. <laughs> I mean, it's almost like tunnel vision focus what we do in clinical development, unless we want to spend a lot of money validating a new way of measuring pain. Now, the, the 0 to 10 scale doesn't work for everybody. And there are a variety of other pain scales that have been used in the past. But think about nonverbal patients. Think about pediatrics. We do have a faces scale that we use in pediatrics or for other nonverbal patients. And other people are beginning to look at other types of facial expression that they can capture on a video camera, digitize, analyze, and use that. We can also use blood pressure, or we can use serum epinephrine as ways 
biomarkers to show whether patients are having pain responses or not, but they're not FDA approved. So I can't recommend that companies use those approaches right now unless they're simply ancillary approaches to the other regulated ways of measuring pain. Thank you. Well, at this point, I'm going to ask that everybody thank Dr. Schmidt for coming here and giving such a clear lecture. And if there are residual questions, I think we could stick around up at the front and grab